primarily out of the first 13 or 12 verses. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, the last time we looked at Peter, uh, as an introduction, we gave us basically a five, five uh, word outline of the book, five chapters. And of course, some of these are kind of interwoven, but it's just a general summation of the book. Chapter 1, Peter's writing to the saved. Uh, chapter 2, he's writing to a separate people and tells them to live their life accordingly. Chapter 3, he's writing to a submissive people and talks about wives being submissive to their husbands, husbands to their wives, and us to each other. In chapter 4, he basically talks about a suffering people, even though the entire book of First and Second Peter could be you know, captured under that heading. But particularly, chapter 4 deals with a suffering people, and he sums it up, lastly but not leastly, talking to a steadfast people. So there's a good, just a real easy way for you to memorize that, uh, that book and just have a general outline of it. And we're going to look at it a little bit more in, in detail uh, this evening. Peter, that name given by the Christ. Peter, is a, the, 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 the word comes from the idea of a rock. And that's what Peter was. I mean, if you look at the apostles, he's always listed first. He had different names. I know I, it took me a long time reading the book of 1 Corinthians. I had no idea who Cephas was. But Cephas, of course, is the Greek-sized or the Greek word uh, for Peter. He's also called Simon. And uh, the Lord also refers to uh, Peter as Simon, the son of Barjona. And uh, unlike calling somebody Ron Gilbert today or something of that nature, uh, they had uh, Ron, the son of Ron. I guess that would be redundant if you got into uh, like what they call trays today, Ron, the son of Ron, the son of Ron, or something like that. But uh, they would do it by whose father you were or whose father who was your father. So Peter there, the idea of being a rock, and a rock Peter was. And uh, it's kind of interesting there in Matthew chapter 16, 18, a, a little word play there when it, Jesus says, Thou art Peter, a rock, and upon this Petra, the feminine rock, I will build my church. Well, the Catholics, of course, try to take that and say that Peter is what the, the church is built upon and try to make him the first pope and try to do a whole lot of things with Peter that Peter wouldn't have had anything to do with had he been a, is he alive today to say anything about it? But uh, that's where they get that. Well, Peter is an apostle. An apostle was something that was just in the first century. There were certain qualifications. You had to see Jesus. You also had certain miraculous capabilities. Those men could actually lay hands on people and could transfer gifts, miraculous gifts. We learned that from Acts chapter 8. When Peter and John have to go down to Samaria because the folks had been baptized. They'd obeyed the gospel, but none of them had received the Spirit. Because Philip, the evangelist, didn't have the ability to do that. So we learn that that's how that takes place. And so an apostle is one that had power. He had the credentials. He had an office in the church that no longer exists. Kind of funny, about 20 years ago, Don Finto up here in Bellevue was claiming to be an apostle of Jesus. And, well, I wanted to drive up there and get some of those miraculous healings uh, powers. But, of course, he wouldn't have been able to do that. It's just it's a fallacy, really, when people will try to claim things that just simply don't happen. I'm talking about brethren now. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was an apostle of Christ to the strangers. This is a very interesting word, and if you have a New King James Version or an English Standard Version, you're going to notice immediately there that there are some differences, and, 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 and a good reason, too. The word is parapitamus, para, beside, pitamus, uh, epi, the idea there, beside, and to dwell with folks from a strange land, to, buy, to be beside, to make oneself at home with folks that you're not really uh, live, you know, that are not really your people. And that's the whole idea of the Bible when it talks about Christians. This world is not our home. You know, we're just a passing through. That's the idea. As Christians, we are strangers and sojourners in this earth. As long as we're in this tabernacle, and we have to live in this tabernacle, our physical life, but this isn't our home. We're looking for a city whose foundations are not made with man's hands, as we'll see here in just a moment. The American Standard Version translates this same word as a sojourner, and that is a person who doesn't have a permanent home. They're just constantly moving around. There's a group of folks in the Lord's Church that drive around in RVs, and they go to different places that uh, need help, and they call themselves the sojourners. And they'll pack up, you know, 50, 60 RVs full of folks, and they'll go and they'll run campaigns, mostly retired people, and I always thought that was pretty cool. But they go with the name sojourners. In the English Standard Version, it's translated elect exiles, those who are been dispersed is the idea. Pilgrims of the dispersion 
in the New King James Version. So if you break all that down, this word is translated strangers, sojourners, exiles, pilgrims. New English Bible translates God's scattered people. You get the impression of what he's trying to say, right? It's folks that are all over the world that are living out there in the world and they're living in the different countries and different places we'll see here in just a moment, but they're not of that country. They're, they're not of that land, even though they may be Turkish or Americans or whatever. That's not their home. That's not their home. Hebrews eleven thirteen, with that great hall of faith that we talked about in the book of Hebrews, says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, talking about Abraham and, and uh, Jacob uh, and uh, Isaac, but having seen them afar off through faith and were persuaded of them and embraced them. Notice those thems. Every one of them is in italics talking about the same thing. Having seen them afar off, persuaded, embraced, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were looking for that city not made with hands. And talking about the great patriarchs, and that's the exact same word here. This word pilgrims is the very word that Peter's using, and he's not using it by accident. He wants us to realize that just like the patriarchs of old, this world is not our home. This is not where we were designed to live for eternity. We're to be with God, and right now, it's a test. That's all that it is. This orb was placed here by God simply to have a place where we can exercise our free will. You can obey God or you can disobey God. You can believe the Bible or you can say, I don't know nothing about the Bible. I don't care about the Bible. And you can live your entire life doing whatever you want to do. And it is such a perfect place that you can choose any discipline that you want to, be it accounting, be it uh, science. I mean, and, and, and branch off into just studying bugs. And you will never be able to exhaust any of those fields. It just keeps running deeper. And God put us in this, in this test situation to see how we would react. Have you ever thought about that for a moment? God could have put us in a place that was black and white. You, you didn't have gravity. You just had just very little choice, very little things. And he could put signs with his picture all of them. You ever seen those uh, Arabian countries in particular? You used to do it in Russia too. Everywhere you go, there would be a picture of the czar or president or Man, if you remember when Iraq fell, I mean, uh, oh, uh, Hussein, I think was his name, he had a statue and a picture of himself everywhere. God could have done that. He could have put his picture everywhere. He could be looking at us right now from heaven, you know, a, a visual face that we could see. Have you ever seen those commercials, you know, where a guy's got an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other? I mean, he could have made it where we have a little angel on our shoulder that every time we try to do something wrong, somebody slaps our hand says, don't do that. But he didn't. He put us in a perfect environment. Where you can see that the evidence is there. You can see that there is a God. You can prove to yourself that there is a God. The evidence is there. Or you can choose to say, hey, listen, I don't believe in all that. And just live your life however you want to. And some people do that. In fact, Peter's going to say most people do that. We're strangers here. This place is not our home. We're exiles. And just like the patriarchs of old. And I just love the play on the word there. Scattered or strangers scattered. This word is from a, a, a Greek word that means to, to, to plant, to uh, spread, if you will. Dispersion is how it's translated in the American Standard Version. Uh, scattered is from the word diaspora. If you have your Bibles, it's just a few pages over. James uses this exact word in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, he'll say, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered. That's the idea. You know, a sower went forth to sow. What was he doing? There's your word, diaspora. He was casting seed, and it was landing in the ground. And basically, that's what Peter is calling these Christians. James will call these Christians the same thing. They're diaspora. They're planted everywhere. And you know what these little plants are supposed to do? We know what they're supposed to do. Go ye into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. That's the idea. We're out there in the world. We're not of the world, but we're trying to influence the world. We're the salt of the earth, and we give the earth its savor. Dispora, talking about the Christians there, of course, according to uh, Thayer. And he says, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, those probably don't mean a whole lot to us, but if we see a map, this, of course, the Mediterranean Sea. You see Jerusalem there to the far right, uh, to, to the east. And then up here at the top, this is where you would find Pontus. Down below that's uh, what we call Galatia. Beside that, to the east, is Cappadocia. Asia, most of the time we think of Asia, we think of Chinese food and things of that nature, but the Bible when it's talking about Asia, generally it's talking about this province. And then, of course, again, Bithynia. This is all in what would be modern-day Turkey, just if you notice a little south in the, 
uh, west of the Caspian Sea, a little bit above the, the Mediterranean Sea. And if you were to go across that sea or the little inlet right there, you'd be into what's practically uh, uh, the Russian provinces today, and you could go up, and a lot of folks believe that's where Peter went up and preached, hence the huge influence on Russian Orthodox and, and so forth. But that's who he's writing to. Now, the thing that just really gets me about do you remember who John's writing the seven churches of Asia? Well, if you look over there, Pergamum, Smyrna, Ephesus, uh, Thyatira, Antioch, they're over in Turkey as well. Here you have these, these men who were Jews, straight up. I mean, Peter was hardcore. He didn't even want to break, you know, food laws. Remember the sheet came down from heaven and uh, he was hungry. And God said, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so. I've never eaten anything unclean. Hardcore Jews, if you will. I mean, they really practiced it. They loved God. They wanted to do exactly what God said along the dietary restraints. They were Jewish through and through. Both of these men, who are they end up writing to? John is writing to the pilgrims, to the Christians who are in uh, Turkey. Uh, Peter is going to write to those who are also in Turkey. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. The Jews had an influence from Spain all the way over to Babylon as far as, I mean, they were everywhere, Okay. But the, the, the influence there, it's amazing to me that instead of writing to the church at Jerusalem or the church over in Bethlehem or something of that nature, we have the recorded sermons of these uh, letters that went up into, uh, you know, what we would basically uh, call even Europe uh, today. I just think that that's amazing that that's what we have recorded. It says, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God. That word elect is kind of interesting because in the original, it's the fifth word in verse 1. Uh, Petros Apostolos Iesu Christo Electus. There, there's the elect right there. But in the King James Version, it drops it down into verse 2, which is okay because if you notice, and that's the, that's the interesting thing I, I just love about the Bible and the languages, uh, the translators, they, keep, they put a comma there at the end of verse 1. Verse 2 is capitalized simply because it's a new verse. Okay? And remember, your verses are not inspired. It's the same thought process. It is not uh, they're not broken up, you know, a sentence there. So they, they can do that. And that's one of the interesting things. When you get into language, you're going to find so many nuances of each one. And that's why, boy, I'm not near as hard on these translators as, as I once was. But the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. These people were chosen uh, according to the foreknowledge of God. How was this done? Notice in uh, the American Standard Version, they keep it real close together. American Standard says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect. Uh, and that's how, you know, I like to do it because when I'm translating, I try to keep all the words as close as I can because I can't remember what three words were ago. The English Standard Version does the same thing. They keep it real close to where it is in the original. The King James says, listen, we believe it's more on emphasizing what's happening in, in verse 2, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, boy, this has hung people up. John Calvin was hung up on this. He would, uh, as we'll look here in a moment, I mean, this has been a source of great division in Christendom, not only in medieval Europe, not only in present Europe, uh, but in America, even today. This word is from our word, prognosis. You know, when you go to the doctor, you get a prognosis. He tells you what he thinks uh, <coughs> is a, a prognosticator, tells you what they think is going to happen. A prognosis. You want to ask the doctor, do you think I'm going to get better? That's the idea. That's where we get that word from. Uh, <clears throat> Same word used in Acts 2 at verse 23. Peter's preaching to the Jews there. It says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God knew it beforehand. This is not something our premillennial friends might like to tell us, that God somehow bushwhacked, was bushwhacked by the Jews on Pentecost. Never saw all that coming when, when Jesus would be crucified at Calvary. No. Peter says God knew all about that. As a matter of fact, this is according to the very thing that God has put in motion, the scheme of redemption. By determinate counsel. God wasn't surprised that the Jews rejected Jesus. He knew that. Determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. He says, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. This idea of foreknowledge. We ask the question, was this purpose or plan conditional or unconditional? Well, me and you as members of the Lord's church, we would say that's conditional. Everybody understands that. Preachers preach. Men listen. And based upon how they react... Is whether or not they become recipients of the plan of salvation, of the grace of God, of that great gift. There's a lot of people who say, man, you guys don't have a clue. God, in the very beginning, chose who was to the very person who was going to be saved. And if you're part of that number, you will be saved regardless of what you do. That's why Wednesday night I wanted you to see 
that quote by Sam Morris, a Baptist preacher from Texas, who just flat out says, once saved, always saved, means exactly what it says. That as a little child, you obey Jesus, you ask Jesus in your heart, and you grow up to be the sorriest, most wicked, rape, murderer person in the world, you're still saved. It doesn't matter how you live. Why? Because of a misunderstanding of the foreknowledge of God and of election. Great division over this passage. Some maintain that the choice of the Father in the selection was sovereign and unconditional. That word sovereign is a key phrase in their vocabulary. In other words, they'll say it's God's right. He can do whatever he wants to, even if we think it's wrong. Even if, if it's wrong according to the Bible, God can do it. He's sovereign. He can change anything he wants to. It's his decision. Everything he does is right. He's sovereign. It's his rule. He's the king. He can do whatever. And, of course, we know that's simply not true. God can't lie. God's not going to say one thing here and then later on say, yeah, you know what, I don't want to do that. That's not how God operates. It's against his nature to lie. They would say it's so fixed that it cannot be increased or diminished. In other words, God set this number. That's exactly what it's going to be. And whether or not you obey the Lord or not, it's not going to change that. If you do obey the Lord, it's because he already knew you was going to and because you had no choice in the matter, which is just simply false. The theory was first formulated by St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, which is a, a country uh, in Africa, uh, of, uh, I was trying to, Ethiopia, and um, about the 5th century, 400 plus in there, adopted and popularized by Calvin, and it permeates religion today. Don't, don't underestimate, you might say, oh, that's the craziest thing I ever heard, trust me. It's in the basis of their theology. Such a theory of election is plainly seen to be false. We know it's false because why? We can look at other passages of Scripture. It's, notice the following passages, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but what? He that doeth the will. Here's a man that can have the choice to do what he wants to do. He does the will. Jesus says that man uh, is, going to be, is going to enter into the kingdom. Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus is talking to a group of folks here and says, unless you change your life and repent, you're, you're not going to be saved. You can't do it. You're going to be lost. The Calvinists would say, well, see, the people that were supposed to be saved, well, they, they were saved, and the ones that weren't, weren't. And well, that makes what Jesus says here absolutely nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. He says you've got a choice. You can do whatever you want to do, but unless you repent, you are going to die. Amazing, isn't it? Acts 17.30, the Bible says at this time of this ignorance, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. Why would he do that? First, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8 and 9, we know, the, we know the, the passages, God should be revealed from heaven or Jesus, uh, his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that what? That obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That know not God and that obey not the gospel. You see, it's man's choice. We cannot worry about that vengeance, that second coming. In fact, look forward to it if we do what's right. If we obey the gospel, that's our choice. Calvinists, of course, would take that choice away from us. First John, so simplistic, hereby you can know that you know God, how? If you keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him, keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. Truth's not in him. John says you've got a choice, and you can do exactly what you want to do. Our Calvinist friends, those who believe in the sovereign election of God, which foreknowledge of God, would say, hey, listen, God set it in stone, and there's nothing you can do to change it. It just absolutely flies in the face of what we know the Bible says. How then was this choice made? Look at the verbiage of 1 Peter. He says, through, through what? Okay, here's how it's done. The foreknowledge of God the Father. How? Through sanctification of the Spirit. Okay, well, how does that sanctification of the Spirit take place? Those that believe God's already made that choice says you have no choice. That's why you'll have men talk about God coming to their bedroom one night and sitting on the foot of the bed and telling them, they're saved and they got a job for them to do. That's why you'll have a man who's plowing with a mule and says, he didn't know what happened. Boy, his legs got weak and a bright light shined. And, Praise God, I was saved right there. That is as false as the day is long when it talks about the sanctification of the Spirit. The sanctification of the Spirit sanctifies men today just as it has since the gospel was first preached. Notice, Jesus says, praying to God, sanctify them through what? Thy truth. Thy word is truth. Why do you think it's so important that we hear? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is the word of God? It's the truth. And what does it do? It sanctifies men. Why? Because they obey it. They absolutely. Just, just the idea that a man can be somewhere out doing something and God just overwhelm him with grace and over illuminate him with, with knowledge and with salvation. It's just so foreign to the scriptures. It, it's, it, it's 
really aggravating. John 3 at verse 5, Jesus answered Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. That idea of the water being baptism, the Spirit being the Word of God, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Consistent with these other passages we'll look at, Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, what? The church with the washing of water. How's he going to do it? By the Word. Over and over again, sanctification of the Spirit is through the Word of God. Men come to an understanding through teaching, as we talked about this morning. Titus 3 at verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How did he do it? By the washing of regeneration, obedience to the gospel, man doing something and renewing of the Holy Ghost. God doing something, giving us that plan. God has done his part, man must do his part. And that is, my friends, is the plan of salvation. Every Calvinist in the world notwithstanding, God doesn't force a man to be saved, doesn't make a man saved that hasn't obeyed the gospel. Renewing of the Holy Spirit is exactly what's being spoken of here. The through sanctification of the Spirit, that's the word of God unto what? Obedience. You have the sanctification of the Spirit, you have the truth, you have the word. Men hear it, they obey, and guess what God does then? He cleans men up. That's how you make contact with the blood of Christ. You hear the word, you obey it. At that point, you make blood with Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. The sprinkling of the blood of Christ is the same thing you find in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, faith in the operation of God. Here, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Romans 6, 3, Know you not, so many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, into his blood. God has extended the invitation. Men accepted or baptized, and God is the one that does the cleaning. Here's Colossians 2 at 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. It's God who does the cleaning up in baptism. We simply submit to it. It's at that point that God says, I'm using my son's blood to clean that person up. They've done what I've said. They've obeyed the gospel. Now they're raised to walk in newness of life. A new creature, they're cleaned up. That's exactly what Peter's referring to here. The light figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. Friends, we didn't create that. We didn't make it up. We simply preach it. It's the truth of God's word. It goes on and says, Through a sanctification of spirit unto obedience, sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace, the charis, the uh, common Greek hello and, and peace and shalom, peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to inheritance incorruptible. It cannot be destroyed. You cannot take it away. It's not going to rust. It's not going to grow old, undefiled, and that fadeth not away. It'll be just as pretty the day you see it a, a million, billion years after. It's not going to go anywhere, and it's what? Reserved in heaven for you, and nothing can take it away. Notice, incorruptible. Each one of these words, undefiled, and this word fadeth not away, come from these Greek words, which mean the very thing. It means corruptible, defiled, but like a little prefix. It's called the alpha prevative. You stick that little A in front of it, and it means right the opposite. And we do that with our prefix un, un, and so forth. Unworthy. Somebody's worthy, we just stick un in front of it to mean they're totally the opposite. That's exactly what happens here. This, this is not, and it's incorruptible, can't be destroyed. Undefiled, can't be messed up. Fadeth not away. It's going to be there for us. Verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God. This word kept here is a military term. And boy, if you can say it three times fast, you got me. It means to be a watcher in advance. Literally to set a guard. And God, who are kept by the power of God. God is the one doing the guarding. He is not going to allow the devil to do something to you that you cannot take. That you cannot stand. God has told us that if we're tempted, it's not something that's common to man, and he'll deliver a way to, to, uh, you know, to free us from that temptation. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 10 at verse 13, he's not going to let us be overcome. He's not going to let Satan sneak up on us and, and do something to us. He's not going to do that. Who are kept to him men. God is protecting this fortress, this garrison. God is not going to let Satan through to hurt us by the power. And, of course, that word dunamis. This is God's power. He's not going to let God or, or the Satan do anything to us through faith unto salvation. Notice that's our part. God's going to do his part. He's powerful. He's not going to let Satan attempt you above which you're able, but you've got your part through faith. You've got to maintain the walk. You've got to maintain the confidence and trust in God. 
And that doesn't mean we need to run everywhere with our hair on fire, 110 miles an hour, everywhere we go. We'll have good days, we'll have bad days, but we've got to be consistent. We've got to walk in the light as he is in the light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. We've got to maintain the faith. God's going to keep us, God's going to protect us, but we've got our part. Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed, the word apocalypsis there, in the last time, this Christian age, this was going to end. There's not going to be a thousand year tribu or seven year tribulation period and a thousand year Christian era of reign, brethren. This is the last time. This is when this is going to be revealed. This uh, word last here, the word eschatos, eschatology, the last times, that's what it means. The last time which we're in, when it comes to an end, it will be with the returning of Jesus Christ and it is over. We go to the last day. That's it. There will be a judgment, and then we are in eternity, not a seven-year tribulation, and then we'll have a thousand-year reign of Christ. That's not, that is far into the scriptures. Not the word rapture doesn't even appear in our King James Version. It is simply not true. Jesus is not coming back to this earth. This is it, and this salvation will be revealed at the last day, at this last time, this era that we're in. Verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, and boys, a reason to be happy. We save, brethren. We're saved, we're going to walk with God if we can get through this life, you know, and be faithful. We're saved, we have salvation of God, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. This word heaviness literally means to make sorrowful, make sad. Temptations, trials, watching our loved ones die, watching people get sick, watching God's name blasphemed, watching our fellow man just absolutely snub his nose and raise his hand in defiance to God, those can be heavy for us. They can trouble us. Peter says, you're triumphant. You greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, for a short time, we're, we're sad. There's things that come up in our lives. There's times that we have this great heaviness. And he's particularly writing to these guys who are really going through it. At this particular time, Christianity is not very well accepted. It's getting a little bit worse than it's going to be in this country if we don't turn things around. I was reading a, just a letter just a minute ago talking about uh, uh, the Catholic Church in Canada going to court and things of this nature. And I realize it's the Catholic Church, but I tell you what, they're being called on the carpet for uh, human rights violations, if you will, because of their stance on homosexuality and saying that it's wrong and preaching that it's wrong and that it's, uh, it's not just a cultural thing, that it is a sin and that people are affected by it, it affects their kids and things of this nature. Well, the Canadian courts are taking them to court and trying to try them to get them to stop saying that because they're saying it's, it's hate crime, it's discrimination. That's exactly what is on the books in our country right now that people are trying to get past. And brethren, it, we're, we're, we're fooling ourselves if we think that can't happen here. Basically, you can take a look at England, you can take a look at Canada, and you can take a look at us in 20 years. That's usually how that goes. So uh, we need to be heads up about this kind of thing and realize, look, we've got to put our foot in the ground and say, no, so from henceforth, we're not going to put up with that foolishness. And we're not going to put up with judges that put up with that foolishness. And it's about time we just started calling some people on the carpet and holding them accountable and saying, okay, you're fired. If you can't do what we want you to do with the principles set forth by God and his word and the way this country was established, then you're fired. Hold your judges who are listening to these people who want to, well, we shouldn't have prayer football games because it violates this one little kid. You know, and they send out 100 letters to 100 different places. I got an idea. If that judge says, I'll hear it, fire him. And then the next judge, guess what he's going to do? Not hear it. That's how people have an influence. That's how people are influenced, period. That's how we influence. Your, your opinion matters, brethren. We live in a country where that's, that's odd, really. We, for thousands of years, that, that hadn't been the case. You know, the king basically did all. But we live in a country where we've got to say, let your representatives, let the folks who guide us know how we feel. you got a phone. You've got text messages and emails. Man, we can harass people just as well as the atheists can. You know what started all that business? Somebody sat down with 100 envelopes and took a paper that they wrote complaining about it, <coughs> went to a copy machine, made 100 copies, and sent it out all over the southeast. And you know what? School systems, local, local municipalities have gotten a hold of that and thought, oh, we could be sued. We could be in litigation. That'll cost money. We don't want to do that. Eek! And they've caved to it instead of saying, who is this person? And throwed it in the trash like it ought to have been done. 
And you might say, well, Ron, they have some. Not if we go back to the leg- They have this thing in, in courts where you go back and you look how other courts have ruled. Brethren, the, the rulings are there. We've been a Christian nation for a long time. And we need to go back and look at some of that jurisprudence and some of those other cases and say, look, we don't need to change this. Uh, and I think we'll be rewarded for it, especially how God loves a, a righteous nation. So we need to be careful with that. You are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Manifold means motley, bunches, different things coming from all sides. You got folks in your own household. You got wickedness in places. You got, you got wickedness in high places, be it the government, things of that nature. And then you've got just the folks running around who are drunkards and whoremongers, fornicators, things of that nature. It's coming at you from, from every way. Manifold temptations. And this temptations, an uh, American senator just goes ahead and says trials. Put him to the proof, man. They're, they're, every day we go through various things. And sometimes it's not even from places you might expect it. You know, from wicked people and things of this nature. Sometimes it's members of the church. Sometimes we're put through trials by folks we, we never even see it coming. From our own household sometimes. And situations come up and they trouble us and they, and they burden us. And Peter says, your heaviness now. You know, brethren, one day that's all going to stop. That's all going to cease. But, in, but until we die, until we die, that's life. That's the Christian fight. I read a story where Alexander, Alexander Campbell wrote that Jesus, after his baptism, uh, took his sword out of the scabbard and tossed it away and never to put it up again. And basically, that's the Christian life. Once we take on the discipleship of Christ, once we become a Christian, we, we jump in the fight. And no, it's not a fist fight. We don't run around putting people in headlocks or arm locks or things of that nature. But the principles and things that guide, guide our lives, it's a fight. And we have to stay true to those. Notice verse 7. That the trial of your faith, same word to use in verse 6, it's a trial, there's temptations, man, we're going through it. That the trial of your faith, what's going to happen? Being much more precious than of gold that perish it, though it be tried of the fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It's going to make you better. It's going to refine you. You're going to become stronger. You're going to be a person. You're going to be like that oak tree that David talks about planted beside of the river. Now people are going to come to you. After you've been through those trials, after you've been through those struggles and you've hardened up and you've become that good soldier of Jesus Christ, other folks are going to look at you and they're going to see how much better you've become and you can be a, a real asset to the church. Not that you're not now, but you can be stronger. And we realize that's one of the reasons elders are elders. They've been through it. And they can be that to help. And we can see that, that in their lives. Verse 8. Whom having not seen you love, talking about the Christ, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with unspeakable and full of glory. It, it, don't that just bring John 20 to your mind? Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, my God. Thomas said, I ain't going to believe it. Not till I stick my hand in that the holes of his hand and thrust my hand into his side. I'm not going to believe it. Well, he got what he wanted. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Seen with your eyes. Romans 8, 24. Paul would say, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for you. Ever seen heaven? I haven't. I've read about it. I see it through the eyes of faith. I can see it in the Bible. But it amazes me. You know how many things that, you know, all the way that John's trying to describe that? Uh, those are just human ways. He's trying to take the greatest things he can think of and put it in a way that we can understand it. I thought it was really interesting. You know, when Paul talks about his trip to heaven, what's he say? He doesn't even talk about what he saw. What's his emphasis? On what he heard. He heard words, beautiful words, things that we could not be, can't repeat. That's amazing. Not only will we be blown away by what we see, but by what we hear. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets. The Isaiah we talked about this morning, the minor prophets. I can't help but think of Amos and uh, Micah, those uh, country prophets. Those things that they talked about. Notice the words here used. Have inquired means to search out, search diligently, means to explore. I mean, they, they mean almost the same thing. Even in the original, he says the prophets they desired, they wanted to, to see. And notice who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. They're writing things down 
and they would like to know more about what they're saying. We find people in the New Testament that are reading what they wrote down and wish they knew more about what they said. You remember Isaiah 53? You remember the Ethiopian eunuchs reading that going down the road? Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, man, how can I? Some, some man guide me. And luckily he, not luckily, providentially, God does what God's been doing, put a truth in order, the truth seeker. And he explained to him, preached unto him Christ, and he obeyed the gospel. This spirit of Christ, I have to agree, I believe with Brother Woods, that the spirit of Christ here is referring to the third member of the Godhead. Just as the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who will be addressed as the Holy Spirit in the next verse. I believe it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Searching water, what, the reason I believe that is because he inspired the men to write down 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Searching what, or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it testified that, that it, that's, that's just the King James and the American Standard well being faithful to, uh, to the, the neuter in the grammar there, and translating it to it, it should be he. The Spirit of Christ is a, is a, is a personage. Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a, is a he. Uh, but because it's neuter in the grammar, they're going to be faithful to that, and they're going to translate it it. When it testified, the Spirit of Christ beforehand, the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. Don't you know that when Isaiah put his pen down, having just written down Isaiah 53, he's going to be like, man, what's that about? <laughs> what, what, what is that? What exactly is that talking about? And de desired earnestly to, to, to know what it was he had just penned, even though the Spirit of God was with him. He wrote it down. Don't you know he wanted to know more about that? The Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. That would be better if it was authentication. Uh, the Catholics try to use that and say, listen, if you're not a priest, you can't understand, you can't interpret it for yourself. That's not what that's talking about. It's talking about someone coming up with it on their own. No prophet of God came up with it on his own. That's what's explained in the next verse. Look at it contextually. For the prophecy came not in the old time. That's what he's writing about. By the will of man. Well, how did it come about? But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what verse 11 is talking about. Exactly what verse 12 is going to continue. Where Paul says the same thing, all scripture is given by Theonustus, God breathe. Uh, <laughs> the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in every good work. Verse 12, unto whom it was revealed, that's to the prophet, that not unto themselves, this is not for you, but unto us, that's me and you. That's, talk, that's Peter in his day and age talking to us as well. Those men weren't writing to themselves. They weren't never, Isaiah was never going to see Isaiah 53 come about. Micah was never going to see the great ruler born in Ephraim of Ephrata, or excuse me, Bethlehem of Ephrata, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. He was not going to see the kingdom of the government of the Lord established in the top of the mountains, Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4. They weren't going to see it. They wrote about it six, seven hundred years before it took place. And Peter says, And to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, the prophets, but unto us. They did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. A couple of things here, and the lesson will be yours. This revealed is the same word we have for revelation, apocalypse. It's a different form of it, but it's to reveal. It's to open, to see. It was revealed to them that they weren't writing to themselves. Not only that, but notice the angels desire to look into us. Look at this word, epithumusin. Uh, the idea is, thumos is the passion. Epi's upon. They, they, to turn on a thing, Thayer would say, to look at it, to study it. The angels desired, they wanted to know, well, what is this? Uh, when we sinned, the angels could say, they were immediately cast out. In fact, they're held in Tartarus to this day, Peter will tell us. There's angels held in captivity in chains until the judgment day. There's no plan of salvation for the angels. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, don't you know those angels are going, whoo, boy, here we go. But it didn't happen that way. And so they've watched the scheme of redemption unfold. And the Bible says they desire to turn upon the thing, to look at what God has done. This next word, to look into, comes from this paracupse, which means to, to bend over, to stoop, to look with a bowed head, if you will. To stoop down, to peer over. The angels have desired to look what it, it look at what's taking place with with me and with you. The apostles, excuse me, the prophets of old, 
They, they had this scheme of redemption. They're writing about it. They don't know all the intricacies of it, but they know, hey, man, this must be pretty spectacular. This must be pretty great because look at all the things that are being said. The angels are going, wow, what's God doing? What do you mean one of the members of the Godhead is going to leave heaven? He leaves heaven, comes down here, lives as a man, is killed at Calvary. Can you imagine what the angels were thinking then? Are we ready to go, Lord? Is he fixing the call us? We're going to go down there and wipe out all those sinners now? No. <laughs> Resurrected from the dead, here comes Jesus again to rule and reign on the throne. I mean, it was something that the angels would, this the spectacular. This chapter breaks down into two parts. The first part we looked at tonight is the blessing of salvation. Oh, what a wonderful thing, a wonderful passage we have discussing how much effort has gone into the salvation of man. Just how much, brethren, I tell you what, it's mind-boggling. If you ever just sit down and for two or three hours read a book, study, what, look at what has gone into just our Bibles. Just for me and you to be able to carry a Bible around with us. How many people have died for this book? I mean, been executed. Wycliffe, they hated him so bad, they not only killed him, they dug his bones up 30 years later and burnt them. And the fact that we have that, so much has gone into the salvation of man. And that's just one aspect of just getting us the written word of God that we can have in our hands today. Oh, it's a, the, the salvation that we have is marvelous. God, the Christ, the Spirit, all laboring through the prophets of old and the prophets of the New Testament to bring us this word that sometimes I'm afraid, brethren, we don't appreciate like we ought to. If we really appreciate it, we really love it like we say we do, then we need to share it with our neighbors, share it with our friends. And I realize we live in a day and time a lot of folks just don't want to talk about the Bible. They uh, don't think it's going to something you're going to do overnight either. Bring it up. Try to encourage your friends. When's the last time, seriously, when's the last time you Ask somebody to come to services with you. Just, hey, why don't you come to church with me? How many of us here, I'd like to just see this. If you came to the Lord's Church, the very first time you ever came to the Lord's Church because somebody asked you, would you raise your hand? Would you raise, somebody just asked you to come to church. Just, I mean, you weren't a member of the church. Somebody said, hey, let's, would you come to church with me? Is there just three of us in here? Do it again. Raise your hand up. Is that it? Four? You know, that's a five. There's a little short hands. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing because most of the time when I ask that question, it's, a, it's about 40% of the folks. Well, there's five of us that are real appreciative that somebody said, hey, you, you will go to church with me? You can be like me and you can say, you don't sna handle snakes, do you? And, of course, you can tell them no. I think it's a great thing. Be, encourage folks. Encourage folks. Appreciate the salvation that we have, something so wonderful that the angels... We're talking about angels now. One angel, member killed 185,000 uh, Syrian soldiers in one night. Pretty powerful guys, pretty powerful beings. Something so wonderful that the angels of heaven desire to get a glimpse of. What about you? What about me? Have we taken advantage of what the Lord has done for us? We need to. The Bible's real clear on what one must do to be saved. If you're not in a saved condition tonight because you've never obeyed the gospel or you've left your first love, we encourage you to come home as together we stand and sing. All right.